Agatha Christie's The Murder on the Links. So today we pick up once more with Poirot and Hastings in chapter 13, The Girl with the Anxious Eyes. We lunched with an excellent appetite. I understood well enough that Poirot did not wish to discuss the tragedy where we could so easily be overheard. But, as is usual, when one topic fills the mind to the exclusion of everything else, no other subject of interest seemed to present itself. For a while we ate in silence, and then Poirot observed maliciously, Eh bien, and your indiscretions, you recount them not. I felt myself blushing. Oh, you mean this morning? I endeavoured to adopt a tone of absolute nonchalance, but I was no match for Poirot. In a very few minutes, he had extracted the whole story from me, his eyes twinkling as he did so. A story of the most romantic kind. What is her name, this charming young lady? I had to confess that I did not know. Still more romantic, the first rencontre in the train from Paris, the second year. Journeys end in lovers' meetings. Is not that the saying? Don't be an ass, Poirot. Yesterday it was Mademoiselle Dubreuil. Today it is Mademoiselle Cinderella. Decidedly, you have the art of a Turk, Hastings. You should establish a harem. It's all very well to rag me. Mademoiselle Dubreuil is a very beautiful girl. And I do admire her immensely. I don't mind admitting it. The other's nothing. Don't suppose I shall ever see her again. She was quite amusing to talk to for just a railway journey, but she's not the kind of girl I should ever get keen on. Why? Well, it sounds snobbish, perhaps, but she's not a lady. Not in any sense of the word. Poirot nodded thoughtfully. There was less raillery in his voice as he asked. You believe then in birth and breeding? I may be old-fashioned, but I certainly don't believe in marrying out of one's class. It never answers. Uh, I agree with you, mon ami. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, it is as you say. But there is always the hundredth time. Still, that does not arise, as you do not propose to see this lady again. His last words were almost a question, and I was aware of the sharpness with which he darted a glance at me. And before my eyes, writ large in letters of fire, I saw the words, Hotel du Fer, and... I heard again her voice saying, Come and look me up, and my own answer him with empressement. I will. Well, what of it? I had meant to go at the time, but since then I had had time to reflect. I did not like the girl. Thinking it over in cold blood, I came definitely to the conclusion that I disliked her intensely. I had got hauled over the coals for foolishly gratifying her morbid curiosity, and I had not the least wish to see her again. I answered Poirot lightly enough. She asked me to look her up, but of course I shan't. Oh, why, of course. Well, I don't want to. I see. He studied me attentively for some minutes. He 
this. I see very well, and you are wise. Stick to what you have said. That seems to be your invariable advice, I remarked, rather piqued. Ah, my friend, have faith in Papa Poirot. Someday, if you permit, I will arrange you a marriage of great suitability. <laughs> Thank you, I said, laughing, but the prospect leaves me cold. Poirot sighed and shook his head. Oh, les Anglais, he murmured, no method, absolutely none whatever. They leave all to chance. He frowned and altered the position of the salt cellar. Mademoiselle Cinderella is staying at the Hôtel d'Angleterre, you told me, did you not? No, Hôtel du Fer. True, I forgot. A moment's misgiving shot across my mind. Surely I had never mentioned any hotel to Poirot. I looked across at him and felt reassured. He was cutting his bread into neat little squares completely absorbed in his task. He must have fancied I had told him where the girl was staying. We had a coffee outside facing the sea. Poirot smoked one of his tiny cigarettes and then drew his watch from his pocket. The train to Paris leaves at 2.25, he observed. I should be starting Paris, I cried. That is what I said, mon ami. You're going to Paris, but why? He replied very seriously. To look for the murderer of Monsieur Renaud. You think he is in Paris? I am quite certain that he is not. Nevertheless, it is there I must look for him. You do not understand, but I will explain it all to you in good time. Believe me, this journey to Paris is necessary. I shall not be away long. In all probability, I shall return tomorrow. I do not propose that you should accompany me. Remain here and keep an eye on Giru. Also, cultivate the society of Monsieur Renaud Fils, and, thirdly, if you wish, endeavour to cut him out with Mademoiselle Martel. But I fear you will not have great success. I did not quite relish the last remark. That reminds me, I said, I meant to ask you how you knew about those two. Mon ami, I know human nature. Throw together a boy, young Renaud, and a beautiful girl like Mademoiselle Martel, and the result is almost inevitable. Then the quarrel, it was money or a woman, and Remembering Leonie's description of the lad's anger, I decided on the latter. So I made my guess. And I was right. And that was why you warned me against setting my heart on the lady. You already suspected that she loved young Renaud. Poirot smiled. At any rate, I saw that she had anxious eyes. That is how I always think of Mademoiselle de Broy, as the girl with the anxious eyes. His voice was so grave that he impressed me uncomfortably. What do you mean by that, Poirot? I fancy, my friend, that we shall see before very long, but I must start. You've oceans of time. Perhaps, perhaps, but I like plenty of little.
pleasure at this station. I do not wish to rush, to hurry, to excite myself. At all events, I said, rising, I will come and see you off. You will do nothing of the sort. I forbid it. He was so peremptory that I stared at him in surprise. He nodded emphatically. I mean it, mon ami. Au revoir. You permit that I embrace you. Ah, no, I forget that is not the English custom. Une poignée de main, alors. I felt rather at a loose end after Poirot had left me. I strolled down to the beach and watched the bathers without feeling energetic enough to join them. I rather fancied that Cinderella might be disporting herself amongst them in some wonderful costume, but I saw no signs of her. I strolled aimlessly along the sands towards the further end of town. It occurred to me that, after all, it would only be decent feeling on my part to inquire after the girl, and it would save trouble in the end. The matter would then be finished with. There would be no need for me to trouble about her any further. But if I did not go at all, she might quite possibly come and look me up at the villa. And that would be annoying in every way. Decidedly, it would be better to pay a short call, in the course of which I could make it quite clear that I could do nothing further for her in my capacity of showman. Accordingly, I left the beach and walked inland. I soon found the Hotel de Fer, a very unpretentious building. It was annoying in the extreme not to know the lady's name, and, to save my dignity, I decided to stroll inside and look around. Probably I should find her in the lounge. Merlinville was a small place. You left your hotel to go to the beach, and you left the beach to return to the hotel. There was no other attractions. There was a casino being built, but it was not yet completed. I had walked the length of the beach without seeing her. Therefore, she must be in the hotel. I went in. Several people were sitting in the tiny lounge, but my quarry was not amongst them. I looked into some other rooms, but there was no sign of her. I waited for some time, till my impatience got the better of me. I took the concierge aside and slipped five francs into his hand. I wish to see a lady who is staying here, a young English lady, small and dark. I'm not sure of her name. The man shook his head and seemed to be suppressing a grin. There is no such lady as you describe staying here. She is American, possibly, I suggested. These fellows are so stupid, but the man continued to shake his head. No, monsieur. There are only six or seven English and American ladies altogether, and they are all much older than the lady you are seeking. It is not here that you will find her, monsieur. He was so positive that I felt doubts, but the lady told me she was staying here. Monsieur must have made a mistake, or is it more likely the lady did, since there has been another gentleman here inquiring for her? What is that you say? I cried, surprised. But yes, monsieur, a gentleman who described her just as you have done. What was he like? He was a small gentleman, well-dressed, very neat, very spotless, the moustache very stiff, the head of a peculiar shape, and the eyes green. Moiro! So that was why he refused to let me accompany him to the station. The impertinence of it. I would thank him not to meddle in my concerns. Did he fancy I needed a nurse to look after me? Thanking the man, I departed, somewhat at a loss. A 
and still much incensed by my meddlesome friend. I regretted that he was, for the moment, out of reach. I should have enjoyed telling him what I thought of his unwarranted interference. Had I not distinctly told him that I had no intention of seeing the girl, decidedly one's friends can be too zealous. But where was the lady? I set aside my wrath and tried to puzzle it out. Evidently, through inadvertence, she had named the wrong hotel. Then another thought struck me. Was it inadvertence, or had she deliberately withheld her name and given me the wrong address? The more I thought about it, the more I felt convinced that this last surmise of mine was right. For some reason or other, she did not wish to let the acquaintance ripen into a friendship. And though half an hour earlier this had been precisely my own view, I did not enjoy having the tables turned upon me. The whole affair was profoundly unsatisfactory, and I went up to the Villa Genevieve in a condition of distinct ill humour. I did not go to the house, but went up the path, to the little bench by the shed, and sat there moodily enough. I was distracted from my thoughts by the sounds of voices close at hand. In a second or two I realised that they came not from the garden I was in, but from the adjoining garden of the Villa Marguerite, and that they were approaching rapidly. A girl's voice was speaking, a voice that I recognised as that of the beautiful Marta. Cherie, she was saying, is it really true? Are all our troubles over? You know it, Marta, Jack Grenold replied. Nothing can part us now, beloved. The last obstacle to our union is removed. Nothing can take you from me. Nothing, the girl murmured. Oh, Jack, Jack, I am afraid. that I was quite unintentionally eavesdropping. As I rose to my feet, I caught sight of them through a gap in the hedge. They stood together, facing me, the man's arm round the girl, his eyes looking into hers. They were a splendid-looking couple, the dark, well-knit boy and the fair young goddess. They seemed made for each other as they stood there, happy, in spite of the terrible tragedy that overshadowed their young lives. But the girl's face was troubled, and Jacques Renaud seemed to recognise it as he held her closer to him and asked, But what are you afraid of, darling? What is there to fear now? And then I saw the look in her eyes, the look Moiro had spoken of, as she murmured, so that I almost guessed at the words. I am afraid for you. I did not hear young Renaud's answer, for my attention was distracted by an unusual appearance a little further down the hedge. There appeared to be a brown bush there, which seemed odd, to say the least of it, so early in the summer, I stepped along to investigate, but at my advance the brown bush withdrew itself precipitately and faced me with a finger to its lips. It was Giroux. In joining caution, he led the way round the shed until we were both out of earshot. What were you doing there? I asked exactly what you were doing, listening, but I was not there on purpose. Ah, said Giroux, I was. As always, I admired the man whilst disliking him. He looked me up and down with a sort of contemptuous disfavour. You didn't help matters by butting in. I might have heard something useful in a minute. 
What have you done with your old fossil? Monsieur Poirot has gone to Paris, I replied coldly. And I can tell you, Monsieur Giroux, that he is anything but an old fossil. He has solved many cases that have completely baffled the English police. Bah, the English police. Giroux snapped his fingers disdainfully. They must be on a level with our examining magistrates. So he has gone to Paris, has he? Well, a good thing. The longer he stays there, the better. But what does he think he'll find there? I thought I read in the question a tinge of uneasiness. I drew myself up. That I am not at liberty to say, I said quietly. Giroux subjected me to a piercing stare. He has probably enough sense not to tell you, he remarked rudely. Good afternoon. I'm busy. And with that, he turned on his heel and left me without ceremony. Matters seemed at a standstill at the Villa Genevieve. Giroux evidently did not desire my company, and, from what I had seen, it seemed fairly certain that Jacques Renault did not either. I went back to town, had an enjoyable bath, returned to the hotel. I turned in early, wondering whether the following day would bring forth anything of interest. I was wholly unprepared for what it did bring forth. I was eating my petit déjeuner in the dining room when the waiter, who had been talking to someone outside, came back in obvious excitement. He hesitated for a minute, fidgeting with his napkin and then burst out. Monsieur will pardon me, but he is connected, is he not, with the affair at the Villa Genevieve? Yes, I said eagerly. Why? Monsieur has not heard the news, though. What news? That there has been another murder there last night. What? Leaving my breakfast, I caught up my hat and ran as fast as I could. Another murder, and Poirot away. What fatality! But who had been murdered? I dashed in at the gate. A group of the servants was in the drive, talking and gesticulating. I called hold of Francoise. What has happened? Oh, monsieur, monsieur, another death. It is terrible. There is a curse upon the house. But yes, I say it, a curse. They should send for Monsieur Le Cure to bring some holy water. Never will I sleep another night under that roof. It might be my turn. Who knows? She crossed herself. Yes, I cried, but who has been killed? Do I know? Me? A man? A stranger? They found him up there in the shed not a hundred yards from where they found poor monsieur, and that's not all. He is stabbed, stabbed to the heart with the same dagger. So that concludes chapter 13 of The Murder on the Links. I do hope you've enjoyed listening to this reading. Please join me back here soon for part 14. But in the meantime, stay relaxed, keep calm, and do, as always, sleep tight. Goodbye.